tidy about we about play way it will go next time the whole thing. I did I tell you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lydia Leskwagwa. I am an LLM researcher at the South African Research Chair in Cities, Law and Environmental Sustainability at the Northwest University. It is my great pleasure all of you to our critical conversation this afternoon on water resilient cities in the face of less and less water. How can government and ordinary people take hands? We have two speakers today. Uh, our first speaker is Professor Craig Sheridan from Vets University, and we also have Dr. Milandri Stenkap, who is our former Glacian PhD researcher. Our topic for today is an important one, considering the fact that water is an indispensable resource for our survival and well-being of our cities. However, as the effects of climate change continue to exacerbate, water scarcity is becoming an ever-growing concern. In the face of diminishing water supplies, it is crucial for government and ordinary people to come together and adopt strategies to build water resilience cities. Without wasting much time, I would like to draw your attention to a few housekeeping rules. Firstly, please be advised to switch off your cameras to save data. Please be advised to remain muted unless you are asked to unmute if you are answering or asking a question. Please try as far as possible to use the chat function to pause questions. And also, please be advised that by being here, you are consenting to this session being recorded. Without further ado, I will now then run you through the program. Firstly, we have Professor Velemin Duplicy to give us a background on GLESS as well as the Critical Conversation Series. And then I uh, will switch back to myself to introduce our speakers. And then we will have our speakers starting by Prof. Sherry Dean, then followed by Dr. Stin Gump. Then we'll have Mr. Kristen, who is our PhD researcher for the chair, facilitating the Q&A session. And then we'll have the final inputs from our speakers. And then Mr. Kristen as well, doing the closing remarks. Without wasting much time, I now head over the floor to Velemin Duplicy to give us a brief background on this, as well as the critical conversation series. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, Ladile, and welcome everyone to this session. Um, the subject class chair has been now in existence for more or less five years. And we recently received the very good news that the chair is upgraded to a tier one chair, which means that it will be, they will receive more money from the NRF, but also more responsibilities. Now, I am merely the caretaker until the end of the year in the chair. And 
as unfortunately Prof. Arnaud de Plessis um, went to the University of Stellenbosch. But we have an excellent acting chair, and that's Prof. Oliver Fuhr, who will take over from next year, and he's already um, assisting me uh, with the chair. The Critical Conversation series is a total initi initiative totally organized by the students themselves. They take the responsibility, they choose the speakers, they organize it, and the idea is to stir a little bit of more critical conversation around cities and the challenges that cities have, and especially as it pertains to governance. And today we have excellent speakers who's going to assist on that. And please feel all free to participate. Just perhaps something to note is that our ESCO power may uh, kick in again just after two somewhere or between two and half past two. So if you lose us, we will be back soon afterwards. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the day. And then over back to you, Ladile. Thank you very much, Prof, for that brief introduction on what less and critical conversation service is all about. At this moment, it is my honor to introduce to you so uh, to introduce to you our speakers this afternoon, starting off by Professor Craig Sheridan. Professor Craig Sheridan matriculated from Springs Boys High School and studied a BSc in chemi chemical engineering at Vets University. Following this, he studied for a master's in wine biotechnology from Stellenbosch. Uh, Craig worked in industry as an environmental consultant for a year for a few years before returning to Vets as a lecturer in chemical engineering in 2010. He completed a PhD in 2013 on the mathematical modeling of constructed wetlands treating treating wine re, wine influence. He is a co-founder of the Industrial and Mining Water Research Unit and is the founder and director of the Center in Water Research and Development. He currently lectures in the School of Geography and Environmental Studies and supervises master's and doctoral students. He is a past president of the South African Institution of Chemical Engineers and and he is also a chartered engineer with uh, a chemical, I don't know if I'm, um, I'm, I'm calling it correctly, sorry Prof for that. And, and he's a registered professional engineer with an engineering Council of South Africa. He's current, he currently holds the Cloud Leon Foundation Chair in Water Research in water research. On a personal note, he is married and has a 15-year-old daughter. He is deeply passionate about education and water. Our second speaker is Dr. Milandri Stenkamp, who holds an LL LLB and LLM in the environmental law and governance obtained from the Northwest University Pochistrum Canvas. She recently graduated with her LLD focusing on law and governance responses uh, towards optimizing water security in South African cities. She completed her doctoral studies under the offices of the South African Research Chair in Cities, Law and Environmental Sustainability. She is currently employed as a grant officer at the Sustainable Energy Africa, an NPO that promotes equitable low carbon Lean energy development in urban South Africa and Africa through research, capacity building, policy engagement, and information dissemination. Her research focuses on perspective on urban law and govern urban law and governance, local government, and the intersection with environmental, climate change, energy, and water law. Welcome, Professor Sherry Dean and Dr. Stenkamp. We look forward to your insight this afternoon. We now hand over to Professor Sherry Dean, who will start with the presentation. Thereafter, immediately after him, we'll follow Dr. Um, Milandri Stenkamp. Over to you, Professor. Thank you so much, Ladile. Um, yes, and the, the one, it's the Institute of Chemical Engineers. It's ICHEME, which is a UK-based um, engineering uh, organization. 
going to just share my screen, but it says only meeting organizations and presenters can share. Are you able to give me control? Uh, yes, I'm, uh, yes, Prof, I'm with you. I'm trying oh. to see if I can allow you to share your screen. Okay. Yes. Great, I'm going to share. And one of my windows. No, that's not it. Still presenting. Sorry, if you'll just bear with me for one moment, everyone. There we go. I'm going to ask if you can see my presentation. Yes, Professor, we can see. Brilliant. Yes. OK, and I'm going to turn off my camera so that the data works properly. OK. Um, <clears throat> so thanks for that that very um, that very nice introduction. And it's I must compliment the CLS Critical Conversations team. It's really been professional. I'm I'm so impressed with the way you've organized it. So it's an absolute honor to have been invited to present to all of you. Um, today I'm going to present a project we did called Herbwet. And the reason I'm going to present this project is it actually talks really well to this theme of water resilient cities in the face of less water and how can government and ordinary people take hands. So our project was called Herbwet and Herbwet is the EU projects they all love a shortening and really it was it was our proper title was accessible grey water solutions for urban informal townships in South Africa. Um, the project was funded by the Water JPI, which is the Joint Programme Initiative, and that's a multinational funding agency, which included the, the BMBF, which is the German partner, FORMAS, which is the Swedish partner, and the Water Research Commission with the South African partners. So some of the context of this is we need to talk about South Africa and Joburg in particular, but not just Joburg. Many of our cities have this challenge we have the world's most unequal country. Um, we all know this, our Gini coefficient is, uh, it ping pongs between first and second. I don't know if we're first or second at the moment, but it's very close to 0.7. So what that's telling us is we have this incredibly uneven um, society. And you can see that in this, this is a magazine, it's Time magazine. And again, Here's a photograph. If any of you know Johannesburg, that's a photograph of Santon. But actually, that's what the photograph really looks like. And that's Alex Township adjacent to Santon. So we're looking at the economic hub of Africa located almost immediately adjacent to an extremely poor um, uh, community. And I guess it's like, how does a city manage this kind of economic difference? And it's not an easy, it's not an easy task to manage. Um, within the context of a place like Alex, grey water is a problem. And as, as an engineer, when I talk about grey water, I would typically talk about the water that's created when you wash hands or when you cook food, anything that's not coming down the toilet, that's black water. So gray water is the rest of the water. It's bath water, dish water, et cetera, et cetera. However, what we know is that that's a very first world understanding of gray water. And in the slide, this is gray water, but this is not gray water like we would find in the first world. This is gray water that we would find in a place like Alex. Um, and I'll, I'll give some detail exactly where this, we were working in Alex. And this is very likely to have black water components in it, as well as any other number of things from motor oils, from cars, through pharmaceuticals. It can take anything, it can have anything. So our project goals were initially to gather some lessons um, that were learned from a constructed wetland in Langrich, which is in Franschhoek. I was on the steering committee of the Water Research Commission project, and it was a really interesting project. And we wanted to do a similar thing but 
we wanted to treat grey water in Joburg in an informal settlement, specifically because Langrach is a rural community. It's, you know, whilst Franschhoek is somewhat suburban uh, as one of the Cape Town sort of commuter or peri-urban sub uh, uh, urban areas, Langrach would technically be classified as an urban community. Um, and it's also very rich, sorry, not urban, rural community. It's also very, that that region is a very, very wealthy rural community. So we're saying, no, let's work in Joburg. It's closer to home. And actually, it's far more representative of a real world um, situation, like, you know, Kibera slum would be equivalent, et cetera, et cetera. We wanted to measure pathogen and chemical removals in a pilot, as well as in real world constructed wetlands. We wanted to test if different materials could be used. But we also wanted, and this was really important, to work with the community throughout to design, construct, monitor, and deal with operational challenges. So how did we do that? So the first, the, and this, this was quite, quite difficult. It took us a year, but it was finding who to partner with. So on the slide, I give you a timeline. We started in 2019. We had a whole bunch of interviews with different Joburg actors, and we made contact with Swetler which was in sort of um, May, May 2019. So um, the, the interview with Joburg actors, we, we interviewed city officials, we interviewed the Gauteng City Region Observatory, we uh, interviewed the ward councillor, we, we met with a whole bunch of different people. That includes also Joburg Water, various different parties to understand how could we work in this context. And then we made contact with the um, I guess the right word is the elders of Swetler, and that was really far more profitable from a, a research perspective than all of these formal partners that were based in the city. So where exactly did we do the work? So the, this is a photograph of Alex. It's an aerial photograph, um, and that's Marlborough Gardens. Here's the M1 motorway. This is Lindborough Park. We worked in this portion here called Swetler or Set Swetler. It's an informal settlement and it's quite close to the north. Just to zoom in a bit, if any of you have been to this part of Johannesburg, the Ha train, the Marlborough station is just over here on the right. We have Kelvin on the left. This is Marlborough Drive that runs through and we were working in this northern part of Swetler. And this is the river that runs through. This is the Yixke River, which was running immediately adjacent to our site. And to give an even closer like drill down into the area we were working, we were working in Silvertown, which is this little portion of Swetler here. So here you can quite see, clearly see the Yixke River. There's the old disused wastewater treatment plant. And this is called the Greenhouse. This was a gift of the giver donation when there was flooding along the banks of the Yixke quite a long time ago. Um, so we said, OK, this is where we're going to work. So let's have a look at what's going on in the world around us, where we're trying to work. So we said, let's have a look at the river water quality, the upstream and downstream from this location. So like when I say location, I mean the point in space. So we took samples at the London Road Bridge and at the a portion, if I go back into this photograph, just north of here is a piece of land called Frankenwald, which Wits University owns. So we had access to that piece of land. We could go down and we could take samples. So it was quite nice. Um, and what we did is, th this is a representative sample. It gives you a sense of what is the contamination of the river as a consequence of this informal settlement. And what you see is upstream E. coli values are in the order of a million. That, is that a million? Yes, it's a million. Um, when we have missing data, it's because we had security concerns. It's, it's not always safe to walk around, especially as a white person in Alex, you have to be quite careful. So if, if we were feeling, um, in fact, not just as a white person, as a black person too, it can be extremely hazardous. But what we did was if we felt there was danger, we missed the data for there. We just said, no, we don't go in there today. We just have a look. But consistently, what we were seeing was that this community but, or this portion of the suburb between London Road Bridge and um, just north of Marlborough Road, we saw from 1 million to 1 billion um, increase. So this is like four to five orders of magnitude increase in E. coli in the river. This is a lot. It's, it's really a lot. 
And this change was relatively consistent throughout our visiting of this area. So it's not like it's changing, you know, like one day it's up, one day it's down. It's relatively stable, this few orders of magnitude increase in the E. coli. What this is telling us is that there's a phenomenal amount of sewage slash black water slash fecal matter getting into this river in this small little pit location. This piece of river is like no more than about a kilometer long. So that's quite useful. We said, let's start understanding the context and the needs. Now we know the broader context, which was the Yixke River. By the way, this data is really difficult to get. We're supposed to have access to publicly sourced river information. It doesn't exist. So if anyone tells you that the data exists, please just tell them, no, it doesn't. You actually have to go and get this data yourself. So what we had was we said, OK, let's have a look at how do we use water and how do we dispose of water in this, in this portion of Swetla. And then we hold, held some design workshops. So I want to give you some of the context of what we're trying to design in. This picture to the right is Swetla in 2020 September. On the right is how it's changed in 20, sorry, the left is 2019 in January, the right is September 2020. Where I'm pointing now with my little laser pointer, you should see these three little markers over here. It says wetland one, wetland two, and this section over here is empty. Have a look on the right. So in 18 months, this whole area to the north of our site got built up. Literally in 18 months, it changed. So this poses a huge challenge for any designer or anyone trying to build infrastructure when you have such a massive influx of like development, which is in, entirely unplanned and entirely uncontrolled. So it's just, it's worth noting, this is really difficult to work in. Second point is that space is very limited in this context. Um, many of you will know these kinds of contexts because you will have worked in them, but this is kind of like a meter apart, these shacks on the left. Um, in the central piece, you can see the density and also you can see on the right, the electricity distribution. And the reason I've shown the electricity distribution is because it's quite important. It's relatively easy to retrofit electricity into this kind of a, a, a plan, an unplanned settlement. So this informal settlement, you basically run everything above ground. Retrofitting both potable and water and well as sewage infrastructure, when the people live in these types of locations, is a much, much more difficult task. And that's kind of why planning is so important, because if you forget to do this, or if you don't do this up front in your planning phase, it's really hard to come back in afterwards and do it. In addition to that, there were multiple interconnected water issues in this location. This picture on the left is a sewer overflow. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, it flowed for four months, literally for four months it did this. You can see it's been there so long that someone's put one of these like bricks to, these, these are big concrete bricks to stop it from flowing out. Um, we have communal toilets that are supposed to be located throughout the settlement and they are, um, but they're not always like emptied on time. And then on top of that, there's rain, which is, is a major challenge for the residents in this area. Um, so we have multiple uh, different types of water issues. And on top of that, like potable water is not necessarily always available where you need it, when you need it. And because of that, people collect water. Now, I thought this was very interesting because the city of Joburg, it's their responsibility to create taps and to put standpipes into informal settlements, which they do. But people live quite far from these taps. So what they do is they create their own reticulation networks from these taps. So this person has one at their house. They went to this tap and they, they dug a hole and they connected and they plumbed their own tap and that goes to their house. Um, this is not a municipal standpipe. This was another one that someone made and they created their own little like, um, this is actually technically a banded area with a drain. And this is a different one with the same kind of design. So these are all community built standpipes. They're not built by the municipality. They're built and maintained by the people who live in these areas. Um, so, but not every house has the means, the financial means to then um, hack into the system and take it into their own homes. Some homes actually have taps inside and plumbed water 
from this system. In addition, water disposal is a huge challenge in this context. So these are photographs we've taken. This is um, Silvertown just to the right of this photograph, the left photograph. And here's one of these, these community built taps that you can see. So you build a bucket, you put your bucket under it. And then when you're finished, you throw it into the sluice, which runs through the community. And it kind of just makes its way down, down towards the, the Yixke River. And this area as well, it wasn't it's actually reclaimed river bank. So what happens is there's an, an immense amount of illegal rubble dumping, which happens into the river basin. And then because it's there, it's basically like the Dutch make land out of the sea. You know, you just put stuff into the sea and the sea moves back. So they've done exactly the same into the river basin. So the river moves further and further to the east and the land gets located and this drains and it literally trickles down underneath the settlement and it runs into the river. So if you go to the river bank, you'll often see like side streams just coming into the water, which are actually just trickling out of this community everywhere. So this is really how water is disposed. Like I said, there is no real mechanism to dispose water except through this little drain and this drain literally feeds into this canal. So we said, OK, we're going to design together. How do we do that? And what we did was we held a number of workshops. And when I say a number, these were many. There were many, many workshops. And as always, it's the ladies who come and the ladies come and chat to you. And they communicated to us both their desires and as well as their understanding of how water should be removed from their premises and their locations. So we were saying, what, what do you think should happen? What do you want? And then we fine tune this, like we are able to do this, we are not able to do that. Obviously our project funding was to build constructed wetlands, so we weren't able to put sewer systems into the community, that, and that was not our mandate. But we said we want to do something with them. So we did that, we had these design workshops, and, and sorry, in, in addition, what we were very careful with here was this is Andrew Thatcher. He's a professor in psychology. Um, this other white chap here is from the Water JPI. He happened to be in South Africa and he just said, please, could he come and join us for the day? So it was really good. We had our funder. But these are our PhD students. This is Motswedi Sepeng. And this is Khabo, who's one of the elders in the area. And um, we made sure that we had translation so that when we were communicating ideas, these ladies could understand us. So in general, a lot of these ladies could understand us, on occasion not, and that just depended where they were from. And also they're actually their age. The younger ladies tend to all understand. So we then followed this iterative building design process. So we had phase one and phase two, building of the constructed wetlands. Um, and you'll see as we get further on, we go through phase two and phase three, and we had feedback workshops. But let's focus on this phase one and building constructed wetland one and two. Based on these workshops, we had buy-in. And because I'm an engineer, we then went and we built, we drew these beautiful engineering drawings, which you can see. So it shows where your drainage area is. It goes into your wetland. We had a downflow overflow system where the water would, the gray water, gray water, not water, would flow through the thing and then it would overflow and then go into the sluice. And really what we were trying to see is, we weren't trying to clean the EXA, we were trying to see, are these systems appropriate and applicable in this context? So we chose two sites initially and we earmarked a third. So they were called CW1, CW2, and CW3 was our location for the third one, which we, we did later on. We employed only local people, and this was really important. And I think this is why we had quite a lot of buy-in from the community. Every single cent we spent went to people who lived in Swetla. They would buy the materials for us, they'd get them delivered, they did the building work, they did the construction work. The only thing we didn't actually buy was the plants because there aren't wetland plant nurseries in Swetla, but that's okay. So these are all local people busy doing the planting. You can see the gravel. Every single cent, apart from the purchasing of the plant, which was actually not very expensive relative to the project, was spent on the local people. And we built our two systems, wetland one, wetland two. <coughs> Sorry. We came back six months later and we said, whoa, what's happening? 
And the answer was they weren't really used. And we said, okay, maybe people need more information on why they, you know, what they're for and how to use them, etc. I'd like to show you something. This is wetland one on the left. Have a look at wetland one on the left again. Can you see the shack is now built up immediately adjacent to it? So it gives you a sense of how rapidly this community is evolving within six months what was in a nice location was now immediately adjacent to someone's um, house. So we said, okay, we need we need more information for people. So we said, and we also needed to replant them because clearly, as you can see, all the plants were dead. This was one of the few mistakes we made was purchasing our plants from a commercial nursery. Um, the master student on this project, whose name I referenced earlier, he went to a nursery in Santon, and we, we bought, it's called Juncus effusus. It's a globally known wetland plant. It's a nice ornamental plant. And they were pretty plants from a, a nursery in a rich suburb. They were not working plants. They had absolutely no idea what happened in this context or what was coming at them. Literally, they died. So we said, OK, great, that's not going to work. So let's try a different strategy. And what we then was, we, what we then did was we actually walked down to the Yixke River where there are lots of these plants anyway, Yuncus is globally um, very widespread. And we dug up Yuncus from the riverbank and we pulled it back to our, our wetlands and we said, let's try those. And we also tried a couple of different things. This is a, a like a cypress. Um, if, if you don't know, cypress is papyrus. This is not cypress papyrus. This is a different species of cypress. We have a couple of arum lilies. But really what we were doing was we we're saying let's use plants that are existing in that environment because the chances are they're far better conditioned to remain alive in this environment. Um, we then did some retrofitting on our, our outlet of the system to control height and this is Goodwill. We commissioned Goodwill to, to provide some information on how to do this. Like how do you use it? You wash your stuff. Please don't. You see there's a tick. You wash your stuff. Two means don't pull out the plants, and three means yes, do wash your and do your washing and put your wastewater into the wetland when you're finished. But again, our usage was low. They were being used, but the usage was low. And the reason for this is actually quite evident in these photographs. I'm showing my pointer. I hope you can see it. It's on these ladies. These ladies are bent at right angles in both cases. And in the middle wetland, you can see our entry point, which is the drain, is being uh, serving a really valuable function for holding the soap while this lady empties her, her wash water into the um, drainage canal next to our wetland. So what this is telling us is that we haven't got it right. Something's not right. But we said, OK, so we know we're not getting this right. What do we do? So first question then is, are they working? So. We then we had a whole series of data. And so this if you have a look at this graph of E. coli, it's actually on a log scale. So the, the differences don't look enormous, but it is actually in the order of 90% removal of the E. coli, which is the fecal bacteria. So we know we were really getting a lot of removal of bacteria from the system. And this is the COD, the chemical oxygen demand. It's a proxy measurement for oxidizable substances, which include organics and other things in the water. And we were on average getting 60% removal of the organic matter. So the answer is yes, they were working. They weren't working especially well, but you know what? 90% and 60% removal is better than no removal going straight into the river. So we said, great. Let's see, maybe we need to do some revamping of these systems to engineer them better based on the observations. So we, being engineers, we, we, we got beautiful rendered diagrams. And what you can see here is we redesigned this entry area. So we have our tap with our little wastewater area, the, the drainage point there, and then it fed into the system. So initially it was just wetland two, and now we've extended it to the side. It was just wetland one, which we've now extended it with this wash area, and we also extended it hugely in length. And then we said, let's build wetland three entirely at that third location. So we went through a building phase. This was called phase two. 
And what you can see now is you can see this tap area here. So we said not one tap, let's put two in. This little area just beyond us was the first wetland and there's the second wetland built up. And what we did with this phase was we also built this big wall adjacent to it with a slight drainage canal adjacent um, to the wetland. And this wall was about as wide as the wetland. And I'll explain what that's about now. Um, and then we also reinforced all the way down the side and around to wetland two. So you can see we built this wall, which, and you can see on the left of the wall, how the, the drainage canal is actually now rising up to the level of our um, wetland. But again, we've got this raised tap area with our two little wetlands. And really this was around ergonomic improvements. And what we did was we actually, I wouldn't say we subcontracted, but it, it probably technically would be classified as subcontracting. We pulled in Rhodes University um, colleagues because they have a very strong ergonomic, ergonomic slash sports science division. And what they do is they look at like human movement sciences. It's, it's all about how to prevent injuries in sports. And we said to them, look, these people are not doing sports. What we want to know is how could we make the systems work better based on how they are bending and how they are using their bodies to do the work they're doing. And that's how we came back with this raised wash area design. Um, and suddenly you can see, if you look at these two ladies on the left, they're standing vertically. This, this is an elderly gentleman on the middle one. And you can see he's also standing very close to vertically. And what we have now is the ladies put the water into their buckets and they do their washing and then they tip it straight from the tap area and it goes into the drain and into the wetland. Now, th this might seem really obvious to, to any of you, but I, I have to tell you, it never really crossed my mind that some of these buckets are 75 to 100 liters. These are not buckets, they're bathtubs. Now, I'm, I'm six foot two and I'm relatively fit. I cannot carry 75 kilograms of water. So the concept of raising a 75 kilogram bucket of water to pour it into a little drainage point is totally ridiculous. And in fact, I even caught myself putting stuff adjacent to my wetlands on occasion when I was rinsing a bucket out. So what we saw, because tipping a bucket is not actually that hard, that's just a little bit of force. And what we did was, we made these ergonomic improvements, which had an enormous impact on the system. We also adapted the area to be more functional. So this wall that I spoke about along the edge here, what we did was um, in the early part of the slideshow, you saw that sewer that, that leaked. That sewer leaked for four months and the ward councillor never once came out. And we left a lot of messages for her, I have to tell you to say we've got a sewer leakage, it's in our site, it's right there all the time. So what we did was we gave an area for the sewage to not run through the community because it would have run straight through these houses if we hadn't done that. And the other purpose of this wall is actually to provide a walkway because we don't want people walking in the sewage either. That's how people get cholera. You know, we know this, everyone knows this, but it, you, you have to design it so that people don't have to step into the sewage if they're walking home. And that's what we did in this area. We actually literally designed our wetland system to be a walkway. Um, and we also raised these walls substantially because we didn't want there ever to be any comeback to us as the researchers saying our wetlands are flooding the community. So we actually made this as a bit of a flood barrier because this area used to flood with every rainfall because it's, it's, it's down a slope towards the river. And in fact, since we built this, this little portion, Silvertown has never flooded. So all of this like civil work had a huge impact on these people who lived immediately behind it. Um, in terms of the costs, in the first phase, um, the engagement, the public engagement phase cost us a lot. It cost 60% of the cost. Um, the labor cost, I don't know, 20%, and the materials cost about 30%. Um, and that cost 30% of the total costs. When we did our extensions, our public engagement phase was much, much lower because we already had community buy-in. The, the, the community were part of this project now. They were invested in it. So there we actually found most of our costs went on labor 
and to a lesser extent construction materials. And I mean, I, I do think that the guys that we employed, they were they, they saw us as the rich people. So we, we had a lot of money so we could actually do extra work. And actually, I must be honest, that also didn't bother me hugely because we were building during COVID times in, in both of these phases. And these are communities with zero income. So, you know, if someone ups their rate by 30 or 40 percent, it didn't really stress me too much. Um, and we also had the budget that we could afford it. So we managed it and we pushed back, but we were well aware of the fact that actually our labor costs were probably higher than they should have been. But that's fine. So that's what it was. And then again, we've now built them and we said, OK, are they working? And so the first question was, what about the pH? You know, there's a lot of soap which goes into these systems, so that's quite alkaline. And always our pH was neutralized. We always had a lower pH, more, much more circumneutral coming out of our systems than our inland, I mean our inlet. But what we didn't know was how well they were working in terms of the bacteria um, removal, specifically the E. coli. And we saw the same trends both with ammonia and with nitrate and with the organic carbon. And the reason for this is that this was a really intensive sampling campaign. We went in for a week in May, a week in June, a week in August, a week in September, and we would get there at eight o'clock in the morning. We'd do our first round of sampling. And as soon as we'd finished that, we'd wait a little while and we'd do a second round at about 10 o'clock. And then we have to go back to the lab primarily because these assays have to be done. The coliforms, they've got six hours before they have to be analyzed. So there wasn't a lot more we could do in a day. And we believe we were missing the inlet peaks. So when we see our outlet values are higher than our inlet values, we believe when we're seeing the eight o'clock value on the inlet, the outlet is actually representing maybe the 6 a.m. inlet value. And we know that in that context, what was probably happening was that there was a lot of what they call chimber, chimber disposal. For those of you who don't know what chimber is, it's the night soil that you keep in a bucket in your shack because you are too unsafe to go out and use those communal toilets. So it's, it's, a, it's a derivative of the English word, a chamber pot, it's chamber pots. And those are supposed to be thrown or discarded in the toilets in those um, communal loos, but we suspect a lot of that ended up in our gray water systems. And that's why we're seeing this increase sometimes. However, notwithstanding that uncertainty, the fact that the outlet was so much lower, well, was in the same order of magnitude as the inlet, if we were missing a much higher pulse, it means the systems were still working. So, but we don't know. We still don't know. Um, and it's, it's very difficult getting this representative sample because security concerns are real in this area. Um, we had an embargo on working at dark or after hours or on weekends. We had to be very, very careful about how we access the area. And actually that turned out to be the right thing because a project manager who lived there, he was shot dead on a Saturday night um, just after our project closed and finished. So it meant that, and I mean, this is his home and it was just really unfortunate, but it meant that we were actually managing these risks correctly. But again, we, we were still trying to say, is the wet band working? And how we know it is working is that our outlet was always less um, had always had a much lower redox potential. So redox is a funny value, but really what it's telling you is, is the water aerobic or anaerobic? When lots of bacteria and microbes are eating and fighting for nutrients and things, you get anaerobic conditions. And that means that it's working to some extent, but we still, we don't know. And what we would really need to understand this would be around the clock monitoring to get something about what are these removal rates. So in some sense, it was a success. We, the, this redesign was certainly a success. We increased the gray water intake to these constructed wetlands considerably. They acted as a walking pathway for community residents. You can see this. I think it's a lady. Yeah, it's a lady was using it. Um, she was going to walk down there. We also created communal washing areas, which were um, the, the, the ladies in the area in particular really like these. 
And we also reduced the injury of um, the, the risk of back injury from these excessive stooping postures with very heavy loads of water. We also heightened awareness around gray water risks. We explained to the community that this water in here is substantially worse than the water in the Yixke. And everyone in this community knows you do not touch the water in the Yixke. It's really, really not good. And I guess lastly, we also, we, we really had a, a sense of community goodwill because we, we worked so closely with this community um, and we liked working with them and they liked working with us. So these were our successes that we, we took away from the project. What was less of a success was the increased grey water disposal led to reduced residence time and lower treatment effects. So really what we, we were actually a victim of our own success. Um, I'll talk about that now. This sewage leak adjacent to our one system overwhelmed it. You can see it's, it's um, accumulated sludge because the sewage came over here and really it just ruined it. Um, we also get rapid sludge accumulation in these systems when they when they're very like strongly overloaded. It means regular maintenance is necessary, especially with high use. Um, and the other one that was really interesting was that the water taps next to we, we just finished building constructed wetland three, and as we finished it, the, the taps went dry because someone else plugged their tap into the the system, which meant there was no water coming in for us. So literally it was we ha we had to abandon it and that's that's what it looks like. This poor chap has this this huge thing next to his house, but I don't think he minded. We actually filled it up for him and he had this nice um, deck area. But what you can see over here is you can see this black sludge starting to accumulate in our wetlands and this one was abandoned. This was in October last year. Um, and again, you can see difficulty with maintenance in these types of contexts. So what were our key lessons? So the, the, the primary key lesson was we were victims of our own success. If you make the system easy to use, it's relatively easy to overload it. This was the best tap in that, in that community because it's so much easier to wash your clothes there when you're standing upright. What that did was it broke our wetlands. The second point was that, and this is something we can all think about, Low maintenance systems are not zero maintenance systems. And maintenance requires energy from people, not necessarily like electricity, but it needs people to actually do something. They have to be proactive in this space. And you also need clear lines of responsibility. Someone needs to say, you've got to maintain the system now. Um, and those lines of responsibility typically work with the city or with your state. So. Again, the, you know, it's it's a really complex space when you're trying to work between the city, the community, and you're an external partner as a university. Um, but I, I think the city were very interested in this. It's also, <coughs> sorry, I had a cold. It's very difficult to work in rapidly changing context. Um, you have this increase in urban density. We always had kids poking around in our system, which is wonderful. I love that they were curious, but they, they tended to also pull out our plants and break our pipes and stuff. So you have to continuously go back and like fix it and everything. And then the fourth point was that service delivery failures rapidly overload these systems. You have to have service. You, ha you can't have continuous service delivery failure. But what we did do was we realized we can and we do make a difference in the context where we put in the effort. The project was making water safer. Um, and also it was essential to work with the community. And this is where we think our project was probably most not novel. It's design, redesign, construct and redesign and reconstruct. So normally engineers come in, they design something, they build it and they push off. We didn't do that. We actually followed this iterative loop where we came back to say, you know, we, we reassess it. We're not working properly. What else do we do? And we kept the community informed. But what we didn't do was we didn't give the community the design brief. And it's in the same way that I would never ask. I live in a suburb of Johannesburg. I would never ask my neighbor to say, well, what do you think your sewage should do? Because it's an inappropriate question. He's a judge. Um, so why, how would he have the skill set or the knowledge to actually answer that question? But what we did 
was we showed them what was possible and was what was not possible. And I think that's far more useful um, as a strategy towards community engagement. Um, and the other thing we did was we provided jobs for community members which injected critical capital at the source. And this took a lot of effort from us to get it right. I mean, many of you work at a university. You probably have the same challenges with university administrations. We were able to pay people without bank accounts for this work. We had very special permission right from our research office. And what that meant was we injected something in the order of 250 to 300,000 Rand into that community at lockdown, just before lockdown and through lockdown to build and to do the work. And we believe that's like it, it served as a lifeline to this community during really difficult times. So the the topic here is water resilient cities in the face of less water. Um, how can government and ordinary people take hands? So these are the types of systems that actually can help to make cities resilient because Swetler is not the problem. The fact that Swetler has no sanitation is the problem. And what it does is it impacts the Yixke River. So any informal settlement adjacent to a river will impact that river. That river then gets into all of our water resources and it makes it much, much harder to treat that water to potable. So Rand water are working flat out at the moment because the Val Dam is so dirty. So really, we should be thinking about this grey water, black water problem because it's impacting the fresh water because we sit at the top of the watershed. All of our sewage becomes our drinking water at some point. How can government and ordinary people take hands? This is a way that we can do it for not a huge amount of money, um, but it's not necessarily easy. And I wish it were easy. It's not. And it takes time. And it requires a lot of flexibility and a lot of openness towards how things can change, which are very, very difficult things to get right in the context of um, civic planning and you know governance type systems. I think many of you are in the political space, so you're probably far more aware of that than me. But um, I do think that this type of strategy can allow us to create water resilient cities especially as we get into this water shortage um, phase. And the water shortage can be as a result of population growth and or water scarcity. And you're probably aware of it. We're due another 600 million Africans by 2050. And the chances are they're all going to be living in places like Swetla. So we really do need to be thinking about how do we give sanitation and potable water to people in Swetla, because if we don't, all our impact, all our resources are impacted. So, yes, I'd like to thank you from the project team. In this picture is myself. Um, this is our Swedish partner. This is our German partner. This is our South African partner in psychology. And this is another one of the Swedish ladies. And these are all the students and postdocs who've actually really done the hard work um, to make all of this happen. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to finish up there um, and I think then someone else gets to take over. Hi everyone, um, as Ladile mentioned, I'm Alandri Steenkamp and I'm here in my capacity as the former Place um, doctoral student, um, and I think I want to start off by just saying, wow, that was such a stunning presentation, Prof. Sheridan. Um, very high level, very informative, very detailed, um, and I think it provides a nice uh, background to, um, or in-depth background to what I will be discussing, which is mostly looking at the law and policy or the role of government in urban water resilience. So please, um, just bear with me, I am battling both load shedding and flu today. So, um, Ladile, if you can start my presentation. Okay, so I will just be turning off my camera while I present. 
Thank you, Ladile. Um, you can move on to the next slide. Thanks. Oh, perfect. OK, so um, as the title of the presentation suggests, I will be looking at the role of government and um, briefly society in enhancing urban water resilience in South Africa and just providing a short overview of the urban water challenges in South Africa and just taking a step back to um, evaluate what we consider to be urban water resilience and then looking more specifically into the legal architecture and on urban water resilience and then the role of local government more specifically. So, um, as Prof Sheridan already mentioned, um, we do face some very acute water challenges, and I think that was um, reflected on very beautifully through the engagement and the different projects that um, the chair has implemented or that um, are currently undertaking. So, some of these um, water challenges that we are currently facing is profound challenges such as climate change, ecosystem degradation, and a heavy reliance on surface water as well as resource de depletion, pollution, and existing challenges that link to other socioeconomic inequalities, while simultaneously also battling the need to secure ecologically sustainable development. Now, this is obviously also paired with other challenges that link to um, inadequate maintenance of infrastructure as well as governance deficiencies. So in light of this contextual background, there are of course new and different approaches to particularly addressing water resilience and water security in South Africa. And the question that arises is what South African city governments can do to become water resilient. And in light of their law and policy imperatives, this presentation will be looking into um, what can be implemented based on the duties or the mandates of local government more specifically. And so as I mentioned, I want to take a bit uh, of a step back um, and just discuss how we understand urban water resilience. And the definition um, that I have on the slide is by the city water resilience approach, um, which is um, developed by Arup Siwi and 100 Resilient Cities, um, which is funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Resilience Shift. So this um, definition of urban water resilience basically sees the a water resilient city as one that can cope, survive and thrive in the face of water related shocks and stresses, while at the same time being at, being able to adequately mitigate and in, um, the impacts on the urban water system. So in this context, resilience does not just refer to bouncing back to the same or often poor state as before. Instead, it implies that there is an ability to transition from the current situation where many of the world's urban poor suffer from dysfunctional urban water services to an achievement of increased and more equitable access to water, better treatment of wastewater and better quality of water. So what do we ex expect of our urban water systems then? We expect of it to persist, so to return quickly to a state, um, a stable state after disturbance but also to adapt, which is adjusting as some gradual changes and predictable disturbances occur over time, but also more importantly to transform, which is fundamentally being able to alter the functions and structures of the system as these disturbances occur. So in light of this, um, understanding what urban water resilience is and understanding also what these challenges are in South Africa, the legal architecture for urban water resilience is quite extensive. However, there's no one specific law or policy that speaks to urban water resilience in that um, specific regard. So South Africa's water laws and the environmental laws are intertwined insofar as it concerns water resilience. And as these problems are starting to worsen, the role of law and governance becomes increasingly more important. And we can also see that there's an important role for municipalities in ensuring water security more broadly, but also sustainable management by providing adequate and sustainable water services, protecting water resources and safeguarding the urban water system against hazards and disasters. So, of course, our point of reference will always be the Constitution. And the Constitution guarantees the right of access to water, as well as a right to a safe and healthy environment, which is not harmful to health and well-being. And this includes the right to basic sanitation, which is implicit in the enjoyment of both of these rights. 
And the constitution also gives national government the responsibility for water resource management specifically, and local government the responsibility for ensuring water services with support, of course, from both provincial and national government. Now, flowing from these constitutional duties, every municipality as defined by the Water Services Act is obliged to progressively ensure efficient, affordable, economical and sustainable access to water supply and sanitation services. Now, the National Water Act and the Water Services Act are the primary laws that regulate water in South Africa. And the National Water Act is the overarching act that deals with water resource protection and requires water conservation in the form of maintaining the quantity and quality of water for ecological sustainability. Preventing degradation of the water resource and rehabilitating water resources amongst others. And it regulates the protection of water resources as well as the quality of water to meet the expectation or the basic needs of people both now and in the future. And some of the other laws and policies on the right, the frameworks, policies, plans and strategies um, speak to operationalizing these um, two acts and are all binding on authorities that implement the acts. So municipalities must, of course, then also consider these in the development um, of water resources as well as the protection of water resources. So the Water Services Act, I want to delve in a little bit more um, into detail. Um, so this act, read with its regulations, provides for the rights of access to water, so basic water supply and basic sanitation provisions that are also necessary to secure sufficient water and an environment that is not harmful to health and well-being. And this act deals with specifically um, water service provision through um, water service authorities and water service providers. And it empowers local government to take full responsibility of water service delivery as mandated by the constitution. But it also recognizes a duty on all spheres of government to ensure that water services are provided in a manner that is efficient, equitable and sustainable, and to provide such services for the subsistence and sustainable economic activities. Now, this act states that although municipalities have the authority to administer water services, all spheres of government have this duty, as I've stated, but within the limits of physical and financial feasibility. And the duty is then on municipalities to ensure that there is adequate and sufficient, sufficient supply of water and sanitation, to sanitation services to communities, but they also have um, legislative powers and duties that have a direct bearing on people's water security and ultimately their resilience. So the specific duties resting on water service authorities include the realization of the right of access to basic water services, preparing water service development plans, which integrates financial, institutional, social, technical and environmental planning and also to progressively ensure efficient, affordable, economical and sustainable access to water, but also um, to see to the selection, procurement and contracting of water service providers, the regulation of water service provision and water service providers, as well as a consumer education and communication. So in the context of water resilience, we want to get to a place where water services are diversified. They are equitable, sustainable, considering both inter and intergenerational equity, as well as where they are regenerative. So sustained development of human capabilities and well-being. Now, some of these other laws and policies listed on this slide um, also acknowledge that local government has an increasingly significant role to play in regulating and protecting South Africa's water resources. And um, all of these instruments acknowledge the role played by all spheres of government, especially the local, but also acknowledging the role and duty to incorporate um, or to allow for civil society or, as we call it, ordinary um, people to participate um, in these processes and to have a say in how water services are provided. I'm going to move to the next slide. Um, so this just outlines what I've already um, briefly stated, that there is a key role of local government in planning and urban development, and more specifically in municipal infrastructure and services, in water energy and waste demand management, stormwater management and local disaster responses. And then the specific duties on local government, um, as outlined from the constitution, um, but I've already briefly spoken about this, but I want to get to the re relationship between municipalities and other government institutions through cooperative governance and intergovernmental relations, which means that national and provincial government have the role and the duty to support and strengthen the capacity of municipalities to deliver these services. 
So um, just more of what I have been speaking about, but the constitution guarantees um, local government or cities the right to govern on their own initiative, the local government affairs of its community and to structure and manage its processes subject to national and provincial legislation. And this includes the advancement and protection, um, promotion and protection of both environmental and socioeconomic rights to meet the basic needs, needs of communities. And these duties include, for example, access to water service and protecting and fulfilling their right to a safe and healthy environment as part of their developmental mandate. But municipalities can also exercise both legislative and executive authority concerning matters in schedules 4B and 5B of the Constitution. And these matters include, amongst others, air pollution, um, building regulations, municipal planning, municipal health services, stormwater management systems, water and sanitation services, which is limited to potable water supply and um, water supply systems and domestic wastewater and sewage disposal systems. So the constitutional mandate then means that local government is responsible for making the aspirations of safety, inclusivity, sustainability and resilience become real to communities, households and individuals, and particularly those who are at risk of falling behind. And this means that they can have they can address these duties or these um, responsibilities through inter alia um, what I, what was listed on this slide before municipal planning development and governance infrastructure development and service delivery including free basic services through spatial integration social cohesion and indigenous support and local disaster risk responses which deals with floods and droughts. So a municipality can, of course, um, ensure or exercise its legislative and executive authority by adopting and developing um, policies, plans, strategies and programs, which also include setting the targets for service delivery. Sorry. Um, and then um, some of the more specific um, duties that it has um, through providing water services is also to establish and operate domestic wastewater and sewage disposal systems and through permitting and li license and registration procedures so approvals uh, getting approvals for water service providers as well as approvals of use of water from another source and industrial use of water and as a water service authorities municipalities just going to slightly move on Oh, sorry, no. Um, so um, have the responsibility for um, strategic planning, which includes compiling water service development plans and bylaws to give effect to their mandate to provide water services. But they are also simultaneously responsible for monitoring the provision of services and the performance of water service providers and water service intermediaries. So the water service development plan should also form part of the process of developing a municipality's integrated development plan and must include an implementation structure. So a critical component of these instruments is public participation, which concerns more than just involving the public in drafting these instruments or getting their feedback once these instruments have been drafted. But it also requires meaningful engagement, which entails relationship building through ongoing consultations and mutual support. So um, this slide in um, emphasizes the importance of collaborative approaches. So if, if we have government efforts that deliver water services or that um, aim to build water resilience through merely routine provision of water services and then maintaining water infrastructure where there's leaks um, or other um, degradation of water infrastructure or where they just prepare legal instruments such as IDPs or um, special development frameworks or these water service development plans and where they have public participation after then preparing these instruments. This will be ineffective to actually advance urban water resilience because this will be um, very secluded or one dimensional. But if we have the point where government efforts towards water service provision or urban water resilience is done through collaborative governance, which has the efforts and inputs of other stakeholders, such as NGOs, private sector, communities, academia, mass media or other um, stakeholders. And where this is collaborative, we will see that there's an integrated and more comprehensive solution. We will have better buy in from broad range of stakeholders. And I think um, the presentation by Prof Sheridan really emphasized that this collaborative form of governance or collaborative form of addressing urban water resilience 
really gets more buy-in. And you also have more effective implementation of plans, policy and actions because you now have the buy-in of all of the stakeholders. Okay. So just to reflect on some of the um, current um, instruments that are being implemented, and I use the city of Cape Town as an example, um, but I've mentioned that local government has certain instruments to its disposal. Now the development of links that exists between service delivery, water security, sustainable development, the environment and municipal governance within the South African legal framework makes it possible for municipalities to use their legally defined powers and their mandates to adopt governance instrumentation that will optimize the obtain attainment of water security, including aiming for urban water resilience and sustainability. Now, these instruments include bylaws, specific strategies, plans, programs and policies. And these um, can be allocated alongside uh, the categories of governance instruments, which are available to municipalities and aimed at in-house or internal functioning and operation of a municipality. These include your IDPs, your performance management systems, budgets, internal auditing and supply chain management. And then you also have your compliance based instruments that keep municipalities accountable in terms of their compliance obligations, which includes your environmental authorizations, your permits and licenses that they are legally obliged to obtain. And then you get your governing instruments, which also include command and control type, like your bylaws, your incentives, your agreement based instruments and compulsory reporting. Now, the city of Cape Town more specifically, um, and I want to um, state this as a disclaimer, that while we recognize that cities are context specific, um, there are certain good practices that are broadly transferable to other cities. And resilience and sustainability are included as being integral and guiding principles in forming the city of Cape Town's overall master plan, which is its integrated development plan, which also includes a climate, climate change programs and related projects. Now, the city acknowledges its responsibility of ensuring water security in the face of the challenges of increasing population, unpredictable weather, weather conditions, natural water scarcity, and the need to connect more people to water. And its water strategy focuses on increasing um, water resilience. And the city has identified its goal to be a water sensitive city, which means actively facilitating the transition of Cape Town to become a water sensitive city with diverse water resources, diversified infrastructure, and one that makes optimal use of stormwater and urban waterways for the purposes of flood control, aquifer recharge, water reuse and recreation, as well as basing this on sound ecological principles. Now the water strategy, aims to take a more holistic approach to water management and focuses on what is needed to build resilience through five key commitments. And these commitments are safe access to water and sanitation, wise use of water, sufficient, reliable water from diverse sources, shared benefits from regional water resources, and then a, being, becoming a water sensitive city. So part of this strategy includes improved stakeholder engagement through collaboration and thus recognizing that multiple actors need to be engaged to manage water across all levels of government and between organizations. So this collaborative approach that is emphasized throughout the city's instruments sees the city and its stakeholders aiming to enhance integrated planning with actors across the Western Cape water supply system and in the province, which includes partnerships with the Department of Water and Sanitation. It also seeks to improve the analytical information base for water resource management decisions and include economic factors into these considerations more explicitly. It also aims to build stronger relationships between the key stakeholders by sharing expertise, information, infrastructure and finances to ensure better planning and cost effective investments. And also to optimize the overall economic and social benefit of water. And then also to improve water resource management practices and practices to ensure resilient outcomes. As well as to explore and evolve contractual, institutional, financial and governance arrangement between water users, as well as um, the Department of Water and Sanitation, given that the city is planning for higher assurance of water supply. So some of the more specific measures that the city is implementing include managing water pressure, minimizing water leaks from the municipal network, pipe replacement programs, substituting potable water with non-potable water, 
improving water metering, revising its water tariffs and engaging with key stakeholders. Okay, so just some final thoughts based on um, what I've um, gone through in this presentation. So achieving urban water resilience will of course require a shift in how cities plan, manage, govern and finance their water and urban um, systems, as well as planning for their long term development. And this will require understanding the specific local context and mean, means to address a, an array of complex challenges in different contexts. So one size fits all approach will definitely not be sufficient or appropriate. It will require looking at inclusive and secure water and sanitation access. Also meaning we need to prioritize the most vulnerable. This includes improving coverage, affordability and reliable, reliability, pri again prioritizing the most vulnerable. Supporting upgrading of water insecure areas as well as in advancing local innovations and integrating local data, knowledge and community participation in decision making. It will require building capability and all of these strategies will need to ensure that our cities or our municipalities have the capability and the skilled practitioners with adaptive abilities and willingness to learn and who can work collaboratively within and across institutions and with a multiple um, amount of stakeholders. It will also require um, or provide an opportunity to take ownership of resilience building at city level through networks, national and international. And they, this kind of emphasizes a need for new and innovative tools and approaches that will strengthen both local administrations and empower citizens while building their capacity to face new challenges and better protect human, natural um, and economic assets. And again, it will also require us to scale our approach. So incentivize collaboration for more flexible and adaptive governance to also build coalitions to strengthen water governance at city level. But it will also require um, practicing integrated water planning and management. It means going beyond just the water sector, taking into ac account how we manage our natural resources, looking at how development takes place, so where roads and housing are built, and also how residents cope with shocks and stresses such as flooding and droughts. So the planning process will need to consider various factors that affect and are affected by water to, to achieve sustainability in water management. This means that water will need to become a bigger part of the urban system and not just the urban water system. So as such planning instruments such as your integrated development plans and your bylaws will need to embody the, um, these principles and the cooperation of which we can be seen in the city of Cape Town's approach, but can also be taken further in other cities or municipalities. Okay. But then also more importantly, um, we need our national government to lead on coordinated inclusive policies that push for resilient urban areas, but also then providing support to local governments. And this can be done through updating and leveraging existing laws and regulations that address water challenges, but also thoughtfully designing and implementing legal tools that can help communities reduce their exposure to shocks and stresses. And most importantly, it will also um, involve capitalizing on opportunities for transversal or cross-functional work in addition to improving partnerships for financial investments and aligning investment across different sectors. So with that being said, um, I want to acknowledge the funding um, for this research, um, which went partly into my doctorate studies um, by the National Research Foundation and the Conrad Adenauer Stifting. Again, to emphasize that these few points are all my own and do not represent any of these um, organizations. So thank you for the opportunity. You can stop the presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the very, very informative presentations from both our presenters this afternoon. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Chris Besaidnot. I'm a PhD researcher here at the Research Chair for Cities, Law and Environmental Sustainability. Uh, it gives me pleasure to host the, uh, the Q&A this afternoon. Uh, so first of all, I would just like to find out if we have any 
questions from the audience, you can please raise your hand. Uh, then I'll allow you to open your mic and pose your question. We can do one round of questions uh, and then we might uh, and then we'll allow our presentation, our present presenters rather to to answer and then we can take another round of questions. So I see Nontlantla Nobu's hand is up. Uh, Nontlantla, if you'd like to unmute and pose your question. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Chris. Um, very, very, I must, I must, I must really say um, I've learned a lot from our experts in, in, in the room today. And as I was listening to, to the last presentation being given by uh, Dr. Stienkamp, I thought to myself that what uh, Prof Sheridan has done with his team um, is actually something that our own uh, government should be doing, considering that uh, Dr. Stiengamp has alluded to so much enabling provisions that we have in, 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 in not uh, just uh, a constitution, but across local government laws and inter-environmental laws that we have in South Africa. So it for me, it gives me a, a sense of a disconnect between, uh, between what we have on paper and the willingness for those that should be doing something to actually be able to, to do something. Hence, earlier I posed the question, and uh, uh, Prof Sheridan made it clear to me, and I was actually expecting that answer when he said that the innovations are actually uh, haven't been seen, or at least uh, across municipalities, we're not seeing them as yet, and perhaps they might just be um, implemented in uh, going forward. But my my question is. Yes, we have uh, local communities and we have uh, uh, local government, but judging by what we've seen with the energy crisis in South Africa, we have seen how it's it's been coming. We've been knowing that we're going to have an energy crisis, but then it happens. We get to stages where we are load shedding the way we are in the country. And then suddenly we've got many people wanting to come in, especially the private sector to say, we also have solutions. So my question is, with the water crisis that we are having, and in fact, if you think about how Ren Water always speaks of water shedding, are we seeing the, the support of the private sector currently coming in, or is this going to be a reactionary approach like we've seen with the energy crisis where they come in a bit late? I'm asking this in light of the fact that, of course, the private sector always, it's, it's, its primary uh, objective is to make uh, 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 profits. So are we going to see them later or are we seeing them now? And I suppose I can, uh, this is a question that I can pose to, to both our presenters today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nontlantla. Uh, I don't see any other hands. Uh, in the meantime, I would, I'll just hand over to our speakers. Uh, I think Prof Sheridan, if you'd like to go first and then Melandri. Yeah, sure. Um... Now, Tlantla, it's it's a really good question. And our current DG of Water Affairs is, is Dr. Sean Phillips, and he's strongly encouraging private sector involvement. I've I've been quite skeptical about this because I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure how the private sector takes over a state function. Water's not like electricity. You know. Electricity, if you have no electricity, you're not going to die. What is your second most important commodity after air? Air, you've got seconds. Water, you've got days. Food, you've got months. So th those are your three priorities, air, water, food, in that order. Um, electricity is a very long way down the list of things you need before you die. So we've also got this challenge with, and it, it's from an economic and a business perspective, it is a challenge about the provision of the five kiloliters, or I can't remember what the quote is, it's roughly that per household of free water, because the, the private sector, you know, someone has to pay for it. So if the state isn't going to pay the private sector for that five kiloliters, who is? Because they're not going to do it for free. Um, so I don't understand this. I, I'm I'm currently trying to get an understanding of other business models globally, because I'm also quite interested in this question, specifically the Danish model, which has involved a lot of private sector, but there it's not like we understand private sector now. I still haven't gotten wrapped my head around it. And the other one I'm trying to follow up with quite strongly is, is in Israel, is how their private sector involvement in the water, water sector is working. Because again, it's a totally different model. And I think 
um, I think there are opportunities for learning if we can look at both of these models and think how can we adapt it. Uh, at a personal level, my fa my services failed. I I have, I have money because I have a job, so I drilled a borehole using a private sector company. I then put in a wood treatment system in my garden using private companies, and I actually do have privately supplied water now as a consequence of that. But it's not the answer. It's not the answer because you can't have everyone doing this because firstly, it's complicated and it requires a huge amount of continuous ongoing maintenance. And I'm lucky I'm an engineer. I can do that. Again, the guy next door is the judge. He can't do that. He, he has no way of knowing how to manage such a technical system. So I, I'm not answering your question, but I think we will see support, but I still haven't figured, I personally haven't figured out what's the mechanism by which they get involved and they generate their profit? Really good question. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, Melandri, if you'd like to, to comment. Uh, thank you, Kristen. I think, uh, wow, Prof. Sharon, and that was um, very good input and a really stunning question, Don um, Sancha. Um, and I have to agree with you, uh, we are very reactive when it comes to addressing crises, um, where the energy would or where the water. Uh, most of the water crises that are currently happening or underway are things that have been predicted decades ago. Um, in addition to what we've seen with the sanitation um, issues that are, have been widespread across South Africa, many of these have been highlighted, um, you know, eons ago. So it's the approach has been largely to react to as the crisis arises instead of being more proactive about it. And I think to an extent, our law does allow us to be more proactive. And I think uh, some of the research that um, Claes has done um, has shown um, that, w for example, in municipalities such as you've seen, I think Makana and so forth, they have, we've seen that municipalities were struggling, um, whether it was financially um, or through governance and so forth. And they this obviously impacted service delivery. It impacts how you are able to access your water services. And these are like the interventions that were identified of post-disaster, if I can put it like that, um, had already been in the workings um, prior to the municipality having reached that state of degradation. So I think um, to a large extent, we can be more proactive um, in municipalities themselves, but also as citizens in identifying where our rights are not, for example, being fulfilled and taking more proactive stance and going to um, the institutions that are available to us, the re um, legal recourse that we have. And I'm not sure if that quite answers your question, but I do think we can be more proactive in that regard before it reaches that stage of disaster, if I can put it like that. And then before I uh, give back to Nonchlantla um, to reflect on whether her question has been answered or not, um, I think one of the questions that Marisal asked uh, to Prof Sheridan, which they have um, referred to me, um, a very interesting question, Marisal, and I agree with you, they can be a role or, uh, for legal scholars uh, or practitioners broadly, but I think it's also uh, what Prof Sheridan's presentation really highlighted is the importance of not just research, but really doing more action based work where you see it's not just about researching or developing frameworks for resilience or supporting policies that uh, advocating for policies that res um, support resilience. It's really getting to the nitty gritty of it, like how can we engage with communities to build resilience? And I think in this regard, there can be a more of an interdisciplinary, cross disciplinary approach where we reach out to communities or where we see where we can build or raise awareness of the risks that they face and providing the technical assistance and supporting the development of community-based resilience plans. It's good, well enough to have, and I speak from my own perspective, it's well enough to have that piece of research um, where you are writing your PhD or you're writing a, an article about uh, resilience or urban water resilience. But it's another thing to truly um, give back into that space. And I think with that regard is really um, 
it can be done, I think, in a in a uh, in two ways. Um, the one really engaging with communities to build resilience, and I think some of the cross disciplinary work that you do um, also feeds into that. And then also monitoring and evaluating re resilience efforts, which can also go a long way in meeting the needs of communities that these interventions are intended to serve. So monitoring implementation of laws and regulations, and also then um, just playing a broader role in raising awareness of the importance of resilience and in promoting a culture of resilience in cities. So I don't know if that would uh, be a more superficial way of addressing it, but I think it's one of the ways that we can step up and really advocate um, for the voiceless or the marginalized in the space. Thank you for those comments. Uh, Nontlantla has indicated in, in the chat that uh, you guys have answered her, her questions. So thank you for that. Uh, I see Mishka has a hand up. I don't see anyone's hand, so I will allow Mich Mishka to uh, pose a question and then I would um, hand over to uh, to the to the presenters and we'll take it from there. Thank you very much. OK, um, I hope that you can all hear me. Um, so thank you so much for the informative presentations. It was very, very interesting and insightful. I just had a question um, to both of the presenters, but I think the first part is more um, dedicated towards Prof Sheridan, and that is that I noticed that the project took place in um, close to the XK River, where we previously this year had like cholera outbreaks, and it was in the news for a very, very long time because of the water situation there. If this project is probably implemented on a much larger scale. Would this then be able to help reduce some of the health risks and the physical effects that it has on people um, in the long run? And if so, like to what extent, how much larger would such a project need to be in order to actually reduce such risks? And um, like, how do we start funding such a big project in a way that does not endanger, like, or like the separation of powers? And and by this, I mean, in the way that the private sector necessarily takes over something that should be provided by state, and also in a way that um, the funding from this is... Um, it's still marketable or profitable for the people investing in such projects. And then uh, for Malandri, I wanted to know like more or less, how can we then, what is the law on this? Like how do we then, you mentioned like that there is space for cross-border um, work on these things. Like how does the law then speak to these kinds of things in cases where like this water does not just affect like the service delivery, but also people's health. How do we then, um, how does the law then speak to that? Yeah, and that's my question. Okay, Mishka, so I'll go first. Um, I, I hope I can answer them because you actually, it was quite a few questions, but again, I think they were really good questions. So the first one was around the cholera outbreak and like the Yixke River. Um, so there's two layers to that question. The one was when the systems that we built were utilized, were not well utilized, we were removing 90% of the bacterial load. So we were using E. coli as the proxy because E. coli is a, it's, it's a gut bacteria. It occurs in the stomach of warm blooded animals in the, the intestines. So it's always, it, it's a very good measure for, if you see E. coli, you know that something's pooped in the water. Just literally, that's what it means. E. coli means that. So we were seeing 90% removal on those small systems that weren't well utilized. Now, in my, in my imagined perfect future, every one of those shacks would have a tap. Every single one of them, not community standpipes, every shack would have a tap. 
and attached to every shack would that tap would be one of these little wash areas with a constructed wetland because they don't have to be very big. Remember, the smaller the usage, the smaller the wetland could be. So I would envisage if you got 90% removal of every single one of those shacks, you would have 10% of that loading on the Yuxke River that you saw where we went up from 1 million to like 10 billion. You'd go back down, you'd actually, you know, you'd go up to like 1.1 million, um, 1 million 100,000 rather than 10 billion would be the loading on the river from that community if every shack had one that was at low utilization. So the answer to that question is there would be real impact on the river, like and significant um, impact. You said how much larger it's so yeah, the vision would be that every shack would have one of these. But I, I want to then just take a step back and and this is something I'm trying to inject into the public discourse at the moment. We call these informal settlements and I think it's a lie. These are not informal settlements. These are unplanned settlements. Silvertown has been there since the early 2000s when there was a previous flooding event in the Yixke and they were moved there into these tin shacks, which was why they called Silvertown because the tin shacks were silver. Um, so I think what we do is we deny these people dignity of a permanent dwelling place if we call these informal settlements. I much prefer the word unplanned because they're not planned. They just spring up around us. And that's the, the point is if you start calling them unplanned, you start changing the mind of the city officials because when you say informal, like no one's going to invest in something which is informal because it'll be gone next week. If you say unplanned, now you have to start thinking, well, actually, this is a formal housing estate. It just doesn't have services. In that context, where do we start to invest and how do we start to invest? But I think this is one of the long-standing tensions we have as a society, and it's not a post-apartheid. This is a much older tension around inform what I'm going to I'm going to call it now around unplanned settlements. Is if we call them informal, we don't have to deal with them. They will go away at some point. We can call in the red scorpions. I'm not going to build infrastructure if I'm going to break it down. And that's why I think we need to change this dialogue. And if we do that, then suddenly I think you start seeing the funding opening because we're now changing the discourse. It's not informal, it's formal. When it's formal, you've got to do something. There's the reason we have so much outcry around the cholera outbreaks in, in Hammanskral and the Vol and these areas is because we're seeing it in formal areas. And that's where the outbreak comes. I mean, not, that's where the outcry comes. And it's absolutely right. But when it's informal, no one says anything because it's not afforded the dignity of being recognized as formalized. So I would encourage all of us to use the word unplanned in reference to these communities because they are certainly not informal. And every single one of my interactions with this community leads me down that path. And then we start to put the responsibility back onto our cities that these are only unplanned. Therefore, you have to start making provision for them. So that was a little bit of civil activism, but I, I do hope it answered your question. Uh, Melandri, if you'd like to respond. Sorry, my apologies. A uh, very good question, Mishka. Um, and I, in this regard, uh, I know I glossed over the specific provisions in law a bit, but uh, our National Water Act and the Water Services Act have very specific um, provisions that detail that municipalities are responsible for, example, water and sanitation services. And in terms of the Water Act, they are very specific obligations resting on municipalities to ensure that their water sources, water sources are not polluted. And with the entirety of the waste and sanitation crisis happening across of South Africa, we know we can hold our municipalities accountable. But I think uh, I recently, a couple of weeks ago, an article by Professor Michael Kidd, um, which I 100% agree with is that if we take our municipalities to court for not adhering to um, their duty in terms of both the constitution and these um, 
National Water Act and the Water Services Act, it's merely addressing the symptom and not the problem. So we take the municipality to court, lay criminal charges against them for not adhering to their duties, but that doesn't address the symptom, like what is the actual issue? And this requires us to address the core of the problem. If it's something that has to do with the capacity of the municipality to provide appropriate services, then we need to capacitate the municipality. And that's where your national and provincial um, government comes in. And they need to provide that um, support um, as provided by the constitution. If it's a problem of the municipality, for example, not having the technical expertise or whatever it may be, um, if it's the in improper infrastructure, then it's Prof. Sheridan mentioned that um, in his comment to Bronwyn, I believe, that's again, that rests on uh, the responsibility rests on the municipality to maintain the infrastructure. So it is something, it, the accountability in terms of addressing these issues rests on the municipality, but there's also support to be provided. So we want to be preemptive, we want to be proactive. So without it getting to the point of um, sewage um, contaminating our water um, sources, we need to provide the capacity to the municipality, support them where they need the capacity. If it reaches that point, there are recourses, legal recourses available um, to citizens, to people um, where these rights have been violated. I am not sure if that answers your question. Uh, Misha, does it answer your question? I, I I do I do see from the in the chat that it that she has re responded and said that yeah you both answered the question. Um, so uh, I don't see any any other hands. So I'll take this opportunity to to pose a question myself. Uh, my research focus pre predominantly on look, looking at the the role of local stakeholders within the service delivery context and how local uh, local stakeholders and local government can take hands in the achievement of service delivery objectives, uh, with water being one of them, uh, various other things. So, but now the question that I that I sit with and I struggle with is how do we incorporate? Or how do we change the mindset of, of your, your average citizen? Uh, because we, we find many times in, in certain areas, people will be much more willing to engage with issues that affect that are affecting their community. Well, in other instances, we find people would rather focus on their house and uh, the rest of the community. Uh, we will we'll, we'll deal with that at another stage. Uh, we... As South Africans, I believe that we are, we are losing that sense of of, of unity that, um, that that this country was was is supposed to be built on, uh, in order to build our communities. Concepts such as Ubuntu, working together. My question relates then to how, uh, Prof Sheridan and uh, Melandri, how we can we can take. Uh, ideas such as the ones that you have presented today and get people involved uh, and take ownership of, of, of issues such as water. Uh, I think I'll, I'll allow Prof Sheridan to go first and we'll follow the normal train that we have been following. No, I, I wish you'd let Melandri go first. <laughs> um, yeah, you're OK, so I, I've I've literally just given my inaugural lecture last week. And part of the title of the title of my inaugural lecture was Into the Wild. And it was called Water Research as an Interface Between the Science and the Humanities. And part of my message in my lecture was that water is not valued until it is. So what I meant by that was when I was a kid, we, I grew up in, in the 1980s. I'm probably a lot older than most of you. But as a kid, we, 1983 was a terrible, terrible drought. And we had people come into our school and they showed us how to reuse bath water in your garden as grey water irrigation. Somehow in that process, it got stuck in my head that water was precious and water was scarce. So 
it's one of those value systems that was injected into me from a very, very young age. So when you ask, how do we incorporate the mindset of the average citizen? We don't do this through engineering and science and all of these domains. We do this through other things like law and politics and art, because those are the levers of society, the lever, L-E-V-E-R. Those are the things that drive us and change us. The influencers are never engineers. They're, they're young people who are into fashion and into stuff like that. Those are the people that we have to use to change the mindset of our society. And it's what I'm working really hard at the moment is to try to understand from an engineering perspective, how can I grapple and engage with these spaces of art, of science, of politics, of economics, because those are where the value sets are pushed into our society. The value systems are pushed into us. Engineers only respond to the levers. If, if society doesn't care about wastewater treatment, which currently doesn't, wastewater treatment plants fall apart, which is what they're doing. And it's only once they fall apart and society wakes up and understands the risks of these things that they start to value the, the treatment plants themselves in their own rights. And this is a process, but I think it's a process. And the answer is around interdisciplinary research, interdisciplinary dialogue. And to do that, the first and most important thing is to respect the other. And the other is not you. So if you're an engineer, it means you have to respect the social scientist or the politician. And speaking for engineers, they're not particularly good at like respecting the others. So I, I really believe that that's the strategy towards it is starting to get all of the disciplines talking and agitating about stuff at the same time in the same place. And that way we can do it. If, if you can figure out how to do that, please let me know. <laughs> but that's that's my sense. Yeah, I had, a, I had a, a bit of a laugh now at the end because yeah, it's a, a question that all of us are struggling with, I think. Um, Melandri, if you'd like to take a stab at it. Uh, thank you for a very important question, Kristen. Um, I think if I were to add anything else to Prof Sheridan's comment, I would take away um, from his message. Um, so I would just like to say I wholeheartedly agree with that statement. And I, I think when it comes to social ownership or ownership of our resources, the narrative really needs to be reframed. And we have this understanding that, um, and in my presentation, I dealt mostly with the role of local government, but um, not really speaking to the role of society. But I think there's a missed opportunity um, often when we see, like, for example, with the huge uh, project that the city of Cape Town undertook um, during the day zero um, scenario, where it really engaged um, citizens and it made them, you know, realize that you know water resources it, we have stewardship we have ownership of this resource and it's our collective responsibility and i think that's something that often gets missed out in the discussions that yeah local government is responsible for all of this or government is responsible for all of this but what happens um, what are my roles or my responsibilities as a citizen when it comes to for example taking ownership of infrastructure reporting um, water leaks or reporting um, where there's sabotage or damaging of infrastructure and i think they can be um, as prof sheridan mentioned there's really an opportunity to use the arts to use the more um the softer means of incentivizing people or really encouraging them to take part of it. And if it's framed in a way that, you know what, if you flush down, for example, these items, or if you uh, see dumping into water sources, that it will affect you, it will affect your health, your well being, your children or future generations' well being. It becomes more personal rather than just saying, no, but municipalities are responsible for ensuring that water resources are not um, polluted. So I think in that regard, um, we do have an opportunity to make it more um, fun or make it more interesting and really make it more personal for the ordinary person to realize that they also have that obligation or that responsibility. And yeah, I think that's <laughs> how I see it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting perspectives. Uh, 
I, I agree with you both in in that respect in in taking ownership and uh, looking at other ways in which to engage with serious problems that we are facing uh, as a society. Um, I would like I, I don't see any more hands. I don't know if anyone else has a burning question. Uh, there is uh, opportunity made now for some final inputs, if, if there's any final inputs from our presenters, but I do think that that uh, final, um, the, the answers to the final question was was quite moving, and I think everyone took away uh, something something from, from what was said. Um, so I, I don't know if Prof Sheridan or Dr. Dr. Melandri Stienkamp, if you have any final words. I would love for Dr. Stiankamp to go first. Thank you, Prof. Sheridan. Um, uh, no final inputs from my side. Um, just thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, everyone, for listening and participating. And um, I hope that this is a conversation that can continue. It is one of imperative importance. So um, I hope that we continually, continuously engage on this. Thank you. I would like to second that. Um, I, I don't have any final points, but thank you for your time. You've all like sacrificed two hours. And exactly, let's keep this conversation going. Spread the conversation as far as you can. Be activists around the space. Make people save water. Pick on them. Um, because that's how we that's how we do it. We change the world one person at a time. So that's that's my last point. And thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. That brings us to the end. I'd like to say thank you to the organizers of today. I'd like to say thank you to the chair, uh, to the presenters, most of all, uh, to the NRF uh, for, for graciously allowing us the funding to be able to, to uh, do research such as this interdisciplinary, uh, get into contact, bring people into this conversations. Uh, today's recording will be available on our YouTube channel. So if you haven't liked us yet, please go over there and like and subscribe to our YouTube. Uh, please follow us on our social media platforms. Uh, and that brings us to the end. Uh, I appreciate all of your time and have a blessed afternoon further. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Ciao.